But does Christianity make sense? Let's admit, there's some weird stuff in the Bible. The Bible, for some of us, it is a source of wisdom and inspiration. For others of us, it's um, an ancient anthology of anachronistic nonsense with more than its fair share of straight up, what the f moments. <laughs> Welcome to the show that loves doubters. On this channel, we are making sense of Christianity by making sense of the doubts that can deconstruct us with near apostate, now pastor and apologist, Dr. Bobby Conway. I'm your host, Tim Hall. Well, Bobby, doesn't it seem a little bit counterproductive to start a new show called Christianity Still Makes Sense with the first show being called Christianity Doesn't Make Sense? <laughs> I suppose it does, Tim. Uh, and as I've thought about, you know, what kind of a program should we have for our first show under the title Christianity Still Makes Sense, I just felt like I needed to concede the point uh, that there are things about Christianity uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, as apologists, we love to provide a rational defense uh, for the Christian faith, and we should where we can. But I fear that we forget talking about some of the irrational stuff uh, in the Bible that is there. Uh, maybe we pretend it's not there. Uh, maybe we don't know what to do with it. Uh, we've often heard, you know, Christians, even apologists say things like, man, uh, those Mormons believe some pretty weird stuff. Or how about those Scientologists? Have you heard about some of their weird thinking lately? And as I've heard that, and I used to say statements like that myself, I would find myself thinking a little bit, but we believe some pretty bizarre, strange, and nonsensical things as well as believers. And I think that we have to be honest about that. And for one to deny that would mean the person probably hasn't read much of their Bible lately beyond perhaps the book of Proverbs, which is practical daily maxims that we can use as we work through the book on a monthly basis with the 31 chapters. So I do think, Tim, that there are things about Christianity that doesn't make sense, but I don't think it's enough for me to say that Christianity doesn't also make sense. It does make sense. Uh, to me, when I consider it in light of different faith systems or different belief systems. But we'll get into that as we begin to unpack this subject today. Yeah, and I think it's I think it would be helpful for you to kind of just just lay out a little bit more of uh, what you mean by the seemingly bizarre or absurd or nonsensical things that are, you know, kind of wrapped in the Christian worldview. So what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes as Christians, uh, there's stuff that feels taboo. Uh, so in times past, thankfully, I don't sense this as much today. Uh, in the book of Jude, we read, be merciful to those who doubt. Uh, in times past, you would hear, oh, let's not really subject this to the church or let's not bring this out. And something just felt inauthentic about that to me. Like, oh, are we hiding things about the Bible? Are we hiding things about Christianity? If Christianity is true, then it can sustain uh, the biggest challenges that come up against it, but also uh, we should be able to acknowledge what's in the Bible. And so I think that today we're living in a time with the internet and social media, uh, we're confronted with having to deal with some of this stuff in the Bible. And I think that if anybody's read their Bible for a long time, I'm sure that they bumped into passages where they're thinking, hmm, I'm not really sure what I think about that. I mean, it's quick into the scripture where we meet a talking snake uh, in the book of Genesis chapter three, or you think about the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis chapter six, uh, verses one to eight. And then some people go, okay, well, was this, uh, you know, the fallen angels impregnating the daughters of men? I mean, there's lots of controversy around this, but it reads as a bizarre. Uh, then you have uh, Balaam, in the encounter with the talking donkey, or you think about the sons of Korah who are swallowed up in the midst of the wilderness. Uh, these are bizarre 
passages of scripture and we scratch our head at it because we don't see this kind of stuff happening on a daily basis, right? Uh, you think about uh, the, the children of Israel before they were let out and the plagues. Uh, that's some bizarre stuff there. Uh, so I think that by talking about this, it can allow us to recognize, okay, there are some things that are hard to understand in the Bible that are bizarre, that are weird. Uh, and then the cross, uh, I mean, think about the cross, for example, 1 Corinthians 1.18, uh, Paul says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Uh, Paul also goes on to say in chapter one, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, right? And so we continue to read it, please God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. But we read, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So even the cross is a foolishness. And so to say, oh, the Bible doesn't talk about anything absurd or foolish, well, the Bible itself concedes the fact that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So I'd say this, Tim. I think for those on the outside looking in, uh, the, the message of Christianity can seem completely foolish. To those on the inside who have been uh, born again, where the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God, uh, it can begin to make sense. But there are still passages uh, that don't make sense to us, as I've already mentioned some of those bizarre stories. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I'm even reminded of, uh, you know, Noah and the flood, like those kind of things, all of yeah. Hebrews chapter 11, where, you know, there's things that are kind of in the future where those people are, are trusting that God has spoken to them and they're saying, okay, and, and we see some of those in our own life. But I, I do want you to get personal here for, for just a minute, kind of pull back the curtain a little bit. It's no secret that you went through, uh, you know, a severe doubt at one point in your life. The the book Doubting Towards Faith came out of that. But but did these absurd and, and bizarre things, did, did this other thing play into any of your doubts? Like, did, did that, you know, cause you pause during your season of doubt? Absolutely. Uh, there, there were times where, you know, I would be struggling in my doubts, Tim, and, you know, this, the, the standard Christian answer would be, hey, you just need to pray more, you know, you just need to read your Bible, which I understand that, that we need to read the Bible and we need to pray more. But I had a developed a uncomfortable relationship with the Bible where my mm -hmm. eye uh, was just catching all of these bizarre things. And so there'd be times, Tim, I would go to the Bible for comfort and I would leave more uncomfortable because I came across more of these bizarre passages. And so, yes, in the middle of my doubts, it was very difficult because I hated my doubts. I didn't want to have those doubts. I wasn't looking to be uh, somebody that was just trying to be skeptical. I wasn't trying to be a progressive Christian, so to speak, uh, nor was I looking for an excuse to move beyond the faith. I, I just was struggling with how to relate to the Bible. There were times where I would find myself going, am I being intellectually honest with myself? I mean, there are some absurd things in the Bible. It seems ridiculous. And so I feel like I, I was coming up with answers to just try to deal with some of these absurdities uh, to make myself just feel better all the time. And that was really, really challenging, Tim. Uh, and there are, you know, scriptures that we can turn to, like Isaiah 55, eight to nine, where we read, for my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, right? So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So while, I look at a verse like this, I realize that God's ways are higher, uh, and that's not a problem for me. It's the fact that God will 
invite us into the ridiculous, into the seemingly absurd. And so that can be a bit challenging. And so while I certainly don't agree with everything about Soren Kierkegaard, uh, who lived in uh, the 19th century, died in the middle of it, uh, 1855, uh, he was a Dutch uh, philosopher known as the father of existentialism. Uh, and in his book, Fear and Trembling, he takes the story in Genesis, Tim, of Abraham being called to sacrifice Isaac. And he gives four different takes on the story uh, when you read it. Uh, and uh, when you look at this story, uh, you know, Kierkegaard, by utilizing his, you know, pseudo his, um, he would use like different pseudonyms uh, in his books. And in this particular book, uh, you know, he's leveraging his pseudonym to talk about how is it that we're to trust God with such an absurd commandment like take Isaac and sacrifice him. Hmm. And so, Tim, you know, you'll hear a lot of people in the church. They'll be like, oh, man, Abraham, yeah, preach it. You know, that's great faith. But if we heard anybody uh, say, you know, God told me to go sacrifice my child and, you know, I started to take him up the hill and I was going to sacrifice him, we would call the police. <laughs> We'd think this is absurd, yeah. right? And so Kierkegaard talks about this idea of teleological suspension of the ethical, where God suspends maybe his normal ethical ways for a higher purpose, mm. to which Kierkegaard would recognize you take this leap of faith into. And so I'm not, you know, saying that this is the approach to take by any stretch. There are a lot of things that I think we can gain and glean from somebody like Kierkegaard. But the thing that I do respect about him is he recognizes the limits of reason and he realizes that there are some absurdities that we can get brought into uh, as Christians. And so as a Christian and an apologist, I feel like we're being disingenuous if we always talk about Christianity as something that is completely rational and just makes perfect sense all the time. The fact of the matter is it doesn't always make sense. There are things that are irrational looking to us. There are things that are seemingly absurd, absurd and bizarre. Yeah. I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, how you can reconcile that tension. But before we do, I just want to remind our audience, uh, this is a new show that we're kicking off. We are formally One Minute Apologists. Now Christianity still makes sense. Uh, still the same Dr. Bobby Conway. But we're going to be kind of taking things in a new direction. And so we would invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're listening to this on the radio and you want to check it out again, you can find it on youtube.com slash Christianity Still Makes Sense. You can also check out our website website, ChristianityStillMakesSense.com. And a quick reminder, this is a listener-supported show, so if you are doubting or you are have doubters in your life and you want to continue to provide a resource for them uh, in this show and the other resources that we have on our website, you can do that at ChristianityStillMakesSense.com and then click on Donate. We would love to have you as part of our support team. So, Bobby, how do you reconcile this tension between the rational apologetics and the seemingly irrational parts of scripture? That's a good question, Tim. And there are a number of things that helped me uh, in that season of my life. And I would say first, I think we just need to concede that there are parts of the Bible that are bizarre. Um, to try to act like there's not bizarre parts of the Bible or to always offer up an explanation that just takes away the bizarre side of it, uh, that's not going to cut it. And I think that the skeptics that point out some of the areas of scripture that are bizarre, uh, I think that we should concede the point uh, and be ready to give a defense of the bizarre even. I mean, uh, you have things that are odd, right? Ezekiel laying on a side for 390 days while he plays with pots and pans and then he flips over and does another 40 days or Isaiah walking naked as he does his ministry. Some would say in undergarments or the two she beers that come out and maul the children, mm. 42 of them in second Kings two, or uh, in numbers five, this adultery test where somebody is thought to have committed adultery. They they're to bring their wife before the priests and the priests basically take some dust off the floor and puts it in a little basin of water and she's to drink it. And if she doesn't, swell up or whatever if no 
uh, the negative effects happen to her, then she's cleared. This right. is bizarre, right? And I think that we can talk about that. And now I would be ready to give a defense for each passage that I'm bringing out, but I'm saying that it's weird, right? Uh, I would say second, I think we need an apologetic for the absurd. Uh, we need to give a reason why we still believe. In fact, here's an apologetic for it. There is a sub theme running throughout the scripture, Tim, of the absurd. It's basically uh, what God does is he invites us into the seemingly ridiculous and asks us to trust him. And when we do trust him in it and he comes through, then in a way, uh, it's the skeptic's view of seeing that, wow, God really is this, with this person. So God calls Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And what happens? Well, he absurdly runs into a wall of water. But then God would show that he's with Moses when the sea parts. And so we can see Joshua walking around the walls. And then when they fall down, right, uh, it's clear that God is with Joshua. So there are times where God invites us to do something. It gets criticized by the world around us, maybe even by the church. But then God comes through and people get to see that, you know what, maybe this person's hearing things from uh, God that, you know, we're just criticizing. And so I think about one story, that, uh, there's a number that I could share, but one where a guy, you know, since he needed to buy a bus, what God, you want me to buy a bus? Yeah. So he went and he bought this bus and he drove this bus home and he was driving this big bus all around town. And people are like, what's with the bus? He said, I don't know. God told me to buy a bus. And he had no idea why he was to buy this bus. But then one day a church choir shows up at his house and knocks on the door and says, hey, by any chance, um, uh, you know, would you be willing to let us use this bus? We have this church choir and we wanted to see if we could use it. And God said, give them the bus. So what ended up happening is, is he was obedient in the absurd by a bus, made no sense. And then what people just knocked on the door that wanted to borrow his bus. And he says, uh, you, know, you can have the bus because, you know, God told him that to give them the bus. Um, I would say another aspect that helped me with this is uh, realizing that there's two street extremes to avoid. One is to shun apologetics altogether because of the absurd and just say you can't really even give an apologetic. Uh, the other um, is to act like the absurd doesn't exist in the Bible when indeed it does. I would say, Tim, a fourth component that helped me is I think we are limited by how far removed we are from culture. So in Genesis 6, for example, the sons of God and daughters of men, it's written in a way that the original audience would have totally understood what was going on. It was written from a place of assumption. Like we want all this clarity and explanation. Well, the original audience didn't need it. There was no need of an explanation. So we can't miss what it means to be so far removed from a culture. And not only that, we can't underestimate how weird and bizarre our culture would be. I mean, we're living in a time where people can get, uh, you know, a male and female genitalia. I mean, there's a lot of bizarre things going on in our culture. We should not think that we're the normal culture. I think if people in Bible times could come back, they'd be like, hey, what's up? I mean, think about COVID. You want to talk about bizarre? I mean, walk in a restaurant, take your mask off when you walk down an aisle and then put it back on. I mean, we had the most stupid rules during uh, COVID-19 with this mask, uh, it, it, we saw the absurdities, the bizarre, and how dumb that would have had to look if people came in from the outside of the culture seeing, the, wait, what is this? They got a mask on and then they take it off and then they uh, put it back on or they take a bite of their food and then they put it up over their mouth. I mean, silly stuff, right? I'd say another thing is to realize that there's no belief system that escapes the absurd, Tim. Christians aren't alone and we always... Uh, think about apologetics, right? We don't always, but a lot. Think about it from a defensive posture, but we can go on the offense, right? I mean, other worldviews have absurd things, right? Like what about Hinduism and, uh, you know, reincarnation or Buddhism, a sense yeah. of Maya, all is an illusion. Or uh, it's not like atheism can, can explain everything. Atheism can't explain free will, can't explain conscience. It can't explain near-death experiences. It can't explain morality, can't explain how the universe got here. There are things that are just seemingly absurd, even on atheism. Right. Uh, so all that to say, Tim, there is no 
uh, worldview that you could adopt that can get away from things that are seemingly absurd. Yeah, no, and I, I think that that's an excellent point. Um, and so I think helping concede this is great for people that are listening, for doubters. And, and let's just say that, I mean, this show, if you are doubting and you are deconstructing your Christian faith, or you know somebody that's in this, uh, you know, de- deconstructing or doubting their faith, uh, we're just trying to provide some resources. And I think this can be a really helpful step. So Bobby, help, help me with this. Why do you think so many people walk away from the faith uh, on the account of the absurd? Um, I think that what can happen, Tim, is people are told, hey, uh, just believe and you'll be saved. And that sounds great, right? Like, uh, I'm going to place my faith in Jesus. I want forgiveness of sins. Uh, and it all seems so simple at first. But then you start getting into the Bible mm. and you start coming across all these different views. And you thought there was one view. Uh, and then sub views and then you start reading all this stuff and people just get overwhelmed and i think in this information age people want to simplify things and they get bogged down by all the different viewpoints that are out there Uh, i think that they get challenged because they're told we live in an age of reason Uh, but that's true in some sense and it's not in other sense i mean think about how much we're chucking our reason out the door to the tune of this LGBTQ uh, sex change stuff. I mean, now we got, uh, you know, guys that are saying that they're women that get to go compete uh, in female sports as a female. I mean, we have so many absurd things going on. We just cannot miss that and think, oh, Christianity is the only one that has some of this stuff to deal with. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, Tim, I mean, I really do think Blaise Pascal said, if in faith there is enough light Uh, for those who want to believe and enough shadows uh, to blind those who don't. And so if people want to stay in the dark, they can stay in the dark. If people want to believe, there are good answers that can help us move our way through some of these seemingly absurd and trying passages that we come across. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Well, well, let's try to boil this down in our few remaining minutes. What's the ultimate linchpin for you when it comes to kind of the ridiculous? What's the what's the one minute answer, right? <laughs> it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Tim. I mean, that settles it for me. And as magnum opus, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are found uh, to be misrepresenting God, right? That's what he says. He says, because we testified about God that he's been raised. But if he has not been raised, our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. And so if Jesus did rise from the grave, then he really did die on a cross for our sins. And if he really did die on a cross, he really did live. And when he really did live, he believed in the absurd, in the bizarre, in some of the seemingly irrational of the Old Testament passages, like he talked about Jonah, right? Uh, So he believed in the Bible. And so I'm going, listen, if Jesus rose from the grave on that one miracle, I can say that if he rose, then he died. And if he died, he lived. And when he lived, he validated the Old Testament that's talking about many of these bizarre passages. But if Jesus rose, then that settles it for me, Tim. And that's how I move forward. Well, and, and that should provide some hope. I mean, just the resurrection itself provides the ultimate hope. But as what you laid out is that we can now dive in and start, we, we can start looking for the making senseness of some of this, if you will. And I think that yeah. should be helpful. That's comforting to, to people. If you've had an experience or, or you have, you know, searched for truth and, and you came up at one point in your journey, uh, loving Jesus and affirming the resurrection, and now you're finding that you're doubting, uh, I, I'm hoping that we can continue on this channel and on this show to provide some of those resources to help make sense. Maybe in the last minute here, just kind of provide a little bit of a snapshot for uh, what's to come here on Christianity Still Makes Sense. So Tim, we're going to be talking about some of the objections that people bring up to say that Christianity doesn't make sense. Objections as it relates to God or science or morality or, you know, the one way issues or scandals in the church, just different types of things. We're going to talk about that. But what we're going to consider is the fact that, you know what, this doesn't mean you have to throw Christianity out uh, because of some of this stuff. Here's some answers that can help 
make sense of some of these difficulties. And so no one ever said that being a believer in Christ didn't come with intellectual difficulties. It does. And we want to help you to know how you can live with that tension when it arises. Well, I would invite our audience that if you have suggestions or topics of things that you would like us to discuss on the show, feel free to leave them in the comments. You can also send us an email. The email will be on the screen. Or you can check out this again on our audio-only podcast by visiting ChristianityStillMakesSense.com and clicking on Resources. With that, we will meet you next time on Christianity Still Makes Sense. Thank you for checking out this episode of Christianity Still Makes Sense. This show is just one of the many resources available to those who are doubting their Christian faith. You can also find others at ChristianityStillMakesSense.com. This is a listener-supported show, and your gift of any amount helps shows like this continue. Click on the donate link on our website. Also, catch Bobby on Pastor's Perspective, where he answers your questions. Finally, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to click subscribe and check out our other videos on the channel. This show is sponsored by K-Wave and Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa.